The next talk is Purple View, and this is Hayden Johnson and Laura Rafferty. And without further ado, so before we do our talk, I just want to mention these three guys. All shocked at everyone's great great value they've added. One guy's like, "Oh, I didn't know users should uh, click everything like that." Like, wow. And then this guy doesn't even know you can log everything, like four terabytes a second or something, someone said. So I thought, although if we've had B-sides here before at this exact spot, I would look like an ass. <laughs> OK, so now I'll talk about our actual talk. <laughs> um, um, so this is our talk on Purple View. Um, purple teaming has recently been gaining attention in the industry uh, due to the recent trend of using offensive and defensive capabilities together. We thought a talk on purple teaming would be interesting. So we hope to benefit those on the attack side, the red team, and the defensive blue team by mixing the two together. So it's going to be a bit weird with us back and forth on the mic, but who we are, I'm Hayden Johnson. I'm uh, from Australia. We have really creative Twitter names. Mine's at Hayden Johnson. I have my OSCP uh, just a couple of weeks before DerbyCon, so yay. And I have an offensive... Oh, thank you. Any other OSCPs here? Oh, wow. Yes, there we go. Try harder. <laughs> it, you'll get it. <laughs> um, and... I enjoy speaking, so we'll see how this turns out. I'm Laura Rafferty. My Twitter is Rafferty Laura. Um, I have a master's in computer science for security and privacy, and I have an interest in both sides of security, and I love presenting. That should work. No? It's not working. It's not working. It worked for me. Okay. So first off, why are you sitting here? Why have you paid money to listen to us two random talks? It's on Purple View. What you can expect is uh, an introduction to red, blue, and purple teaming and what each is. We're going to run through an attack from gaining access to lateral movement, privilege escalation, and data exfiltration. And we're going to show the red side, the attacking side, and the blue side. So I'm just going to... Do this, yep. So, and then possible purple team exercises. Oh, I'm going to have to... Oh, yeah, yeah. That one, yep. So the first definitions are for maybe people that are in school or new to InfoSec or just don't know or you old people have forgotten, a bit of memory leak. <laughs> the, the, the <laughs> an exploit is the thing used to gain access to a system. So in our case, we can use a flash exploit. It could be a SMB exploit or some, something through that. So that's what we mean when we refer to the exploit. A payload is what goes along with the exploit and what happens in a computer or a system or a device when the exploit happens. So you might want a shell command. You might want to just run a dir, an ls, or print something. But most of the time, we want to get a reverse or bind shell. Metasploit, those new people, it's an open source framework. Basically, you... Um, download it, it's free, you shoot attacks, pretty much. It's got like attacks from decades ago. And famous Meterpreter from Oliver Reeves is an advanced payload. It does DLL injection through Windows natively, and you can extend it with functionality as you want. So when we refer to a reversal bind shell, we just mean getting remote access, CMD terminal, or in Unix it would be bash or something like that. So the red team, has anyone heard of that term before? It's not convoluted or like the cloud or anything. What, <laughs> what it, it was originally a military term. So from that, the military actually use it to train as an attacker, either like China or whatnot, to test the blue team's defense. So in this context, it's meant to mean that. It's used in the college cyber defense competition, CCDC, which are Raphael, Mudge, and everyone, they test the college blue team defenders. Red team is for wargaming. So we refer to them as like penetration testers, advanced pen testing, things like that. They do the scans, they do the exploits, they do logic abuse. So you shouldn't really need an exploit within an enterprise environment. You can just sniff the traffic or default passwords. And they try to get access to things they shouldn't. 
and hence the memes scan all the things. Blue team, so us as blue teamers, I forgot, I'm sort of swapping between two here, so sorry. We block, we prevent, we defend, we log all the things, as the previous talk said. We look at emails for phishing emails, we look at events, triggers, networking, and then we log more, or look at more logs. The goals of red teaming, as pen testing and whatnot, are to model recent threats and trends. The red teaming are more longer term engagements. They highlight gaps in security co controls and whatnot. And if they're advanced enough, they'll try to escape and evade persistence, try to stay in your network longer and maybe model an APT. That was meant to be my uh, timer for 50 minutes. <laughs> so the blue team goals are obviously um, to detect, respond as much as possible, and defend all the things, identify gaps, and for management, try to get more investment. And so now we come to the idea of purple teaming. At their most basic level, the ultimate goal of both the red and the blue team are is to help an organization to be more secure. Both teams have useful skills that could benefit the other to help them be more effective at their jobs. So simply the idea of purple teaming is to use the knowledge between the red and the blue team to achieve this goal of helping the organization to be more secure. Um, purple teaming has a focus on training security personnel in an effort to help identify and respond to attacks. It exposes the blue team to different threats so they can identify and respond to them. And they're also able to test their incident detection and response to live simulated threats. Um, observing, or the red team observing how their attacks are or are not detected allows for the tuning of controls, policies, and procedures, and also allows the red team to more thoroughly understand the impact of their penetration testing and sharpen their skills. Purple teaming can include live exercises, so potentially sitting with a network defense team and educating them on a pen test arsenal, exposing them to attacker mindset and tools. Um, also replicating attacks of a race, recent APT or a threat uh, and discussing how to mitigate and detect uh, those threats. Uh, blue team can also test traffic generation in their sim uh, Cobalt Strike is an APT threat simulation tool that can also be used for purple teaming exercises. And Wargaming is also an option to do live exercises with higher level management. So with purple teaming, we are analyzing the security posture of the organization and finding weaknesses, then using them for scenarios or walkthroughs. Um, the idea is on training staff and tuning appliances. So this allows for both red and blue teamers to understand the technology they're working with rather than blindly de depending on tools. Um, this is different from penetration testing and how it's not just receiving a report at the end and then finding the same issues in the next pen test. Instead, it's goal-oriented and tested live with everyone actively involved. So being goal-oriented, it focuses on a particular weakness in the organization instead of just vulnerability scanning. Uh, Microsoft uses their red team to identify the key points in this slide and to reduce the impact of these. Uh, from here, they can identify what areas could use more investment. Um, these will help identify and test security appliances. It'll test if they actually work uh, when the attack was picked up and how, and how good the response is. Um, one of the major benefits of purple teaming is the exposure to practical exercises as a team. Uh, many people see events and logs, but not many have live experience dealing with an active threat. So this quote here just emphasizes that purple teaming is a real thing. Uh, companies offer it as a service and companies pay for it. So as discussed, we're very simply going to show gaining access, some lateral movement, privilege escalation from local admin to domain admin, maintaining access with a C2, and some data exfiltration. 
So this is our demo architecture uh, that we put together in VirtualBox. We have a Windows Server 2012 domain controller and two client PCs running Windows 7. We also have one domain user, Pikachu, as well as one local admin for each client and one domain admin for the whole domain. So first off, the tools we use, uh, they are Kali Linux is a very commonly used penetration testing distribution that probably 99% of you use. Metasploit, as mentioned before, Meterpreter, we're going to show Powersploit, which is available on GitHub. It's a bunch of PowerShell modules. Twitter, not Twitter, as a uh, C2 backdoor. And we're going to show Wireshark, some PCAPs, and uh, security event logs, which are amazingly hard to actually get set up to actually record. So on our domain controller, we set up group policies in Active Directory to enable logging for both successful and failed events, such as account logon events and privilege use. And we'll see this later on during our attacks, which generate these logs. Uh, so first, um, I'll start with the initial attack vector, gaining access. And here we're using a flat, uh, flash exploit from the hacking team from July. Um, so first I'll just talk a little bit about flash exploits. Um, so flash plugins are written in C and vulnerable to come in C attacks such as buffer overflows. Um, you can embed a JavaScript binary or binary object within a flash file. So this is an easy way to deliver an encoded version of an executable wrapped in a flash object. Um, Shockwave flash files are also a thing. Uh, <laughs> a flash action script supports events and can be used to redirect to a malicious URL. Uh, you can define an event, for example, hovering over a flash object, and then when the event triggers, redirect the browser to a landing page. So most exploit kit landing pages redirect to pages containing flash exploit objects. For example, the Angular lang landing page um, uh, uh, supports different versions of Flash exploits, uh, delivers an exploit after scanning the browser version and Flash installed on the victim's machine. Um, so since Flash is installed by default on the browser is a good entry point into the system, uh, new vulnerabilities are identified on almost a weekly basis uh, and actively researched by attackers. Um, there have been several zero-day vulnerabilities for Flash during the past few months. So here is just an overview of this attack. We gain initial access to the corp.test.com domain using the hacking team zero-day flash exploit from July 2015. Um, we imported the Metasploit module for the flash exploit on our Kali machine. Um, we're assuming that the user was redirected to this page through a phishing email, uh, which we just skipped over that part for interest of time, but um, the client is using an old version of Flash vulnerable to this exploit. When the client connects, a session is established and we're able to get a shell on client one. So here's the Flash exploit we used, available on Security Focus, and on the client machine we have Flash version <coughs> 18. Uh, so here we're just setting the options through Metasploit. Uh, we attach the payload into Metasploit uh, and chose the IP of the attacking machine um, and the IP address of the web server as well as the port 8080. Um, we set a reverse TCP payload set with the IP address we're catching the payload with and the port number 4444. So here we start the exploit hosted on our web server and wait for the victim to navigate to the page. Uh, here from the client PC, we see the user navigated to the malicious page in Internet Explorer and then is redirected to the page infected with the Flash exploit. For illustration, we made a redirect button, uh, but uh, in real life, this would likely be hidden to the user who would <laughs> automatically be redirected in an iframe, although a lot of people like to click buttons, so probably they would also click it. <laughs> um, yeah, in the instance of a real attack, there would be multiple redirection gate and gates. So upon redirection, the client is connected to our exploit and a meterpreter session is established with the client PC. 
Um, this shows the attacker sending the exploit and simply receiving a connection from the victim, in this case, the .102 address, which is client one. So now we can run commands such as get UID and see that the user is Pikachu on the corp domain. Uh, now we can also successfully drop into a shell on the client one PC. So we've gained initial access into the network and have all the functionality that an um, interpreter session provides. So here's the PCAP. You can see that the user connects to the slash redirect.html file and it, uh, they click the button, the fabulous redirect button, and then we're delivering the payload because they redirect to our page on 8080. And then that's what you can see from the uh, client side. So as you can clearly see, it's a flash exploit, so it's pretty easy to correlate. And then the th three packets on the bottom are just a interpreter session beginning. So it sends like a thousand packets or something once it connects. And so what you can take away is that you can instantly install Security Onion. It's free. It's a Linux distro with some great defender tools, including Snort. You can then confirm if, if Flash is needed in your business. A lot of people will say, yes, I need Flash to run my cat videos, but do you really need to? And because it's one of the most common attack vectors, I would advise putting Flash in your patching cycle as one of the top priorities so that it's patched as soon as possible. We did find some snort rules. Uh, we were unable to get them working in snort due to time constraints, but they are available. And that's actually relevant to the same CV as the flash exploit we just showed you. So from this purple team exercise, the blue team understands how an attackers can gain initial access. Uh, flash exploits are an ongoing issue, so this helps the blue team understand what suspicious traffic looks like and what is happening from the attacker perspective. Uh, the red team sees how attacks are visible by the blue team, and they can think of ways to make it more stealthy. For example, iframes, automatic redirects, or different types of payloads. Um, next. Uh, we would have a privilege escalation, but we're skipping this part if for interest of time. I'll quickly just mention it as a critical step. Um, so we gained initial access as a domain user, and we will then escalate privileges to local admin to perform the next attack. And privilege escalation from local admin to domain admin will be discussed in a future section. So our fictitious attacker now is a local admin user on client one. They've uh, privilege escalated from Pikachu and now an attacker will want to get situation awareness in your enterprise network. So we're just gonna show you an attacker that attempting to move around and using PowerSploit to do so in order to get a reverse shell on client two. So the very first thing is PowerSploit. It's open, it's free from GitHub, it's open source and it's developed by manifestation. So a lot of, um, PowerShell modules, as it says. It says it's focused on all stages of a penetration test or a threat simulation, but it's more focused on post-exploitation and uh, being stealthy or not writing to disk is what it mostly claims. If you do want to try it out yourself, it's on GitHub. I would also suggest using PowerView because it's newer and it's run through PowerShell Empire, which re was released at Black Hat. So it's open source free as well and then you can be lead hacker with the big guys. The main reason I wanted to show this type of lateral movement is because Sean Metcalf, uh, adssecurity.org, released an article on October 14th, I think, and it's one of the top problems he sees in uh, enterprise environments is that the same password can be used on every system. So local admin, one, two, three, up to 3,000, however many clients you have. So it's almost a pseudo type of domain admin. So once you get local admin, you can just move around quite freely. As this uh, nice, li nice little diagram uh, Laura created, you can just jump from one to the other quite easily. So our setup was um, that power, I normally read off the slides anyway, but um, we are going to use PowerShell to connect to, from client one to client two because we already have a shell on client one. And in order to do that, we're going to remotely connect to client two, have client two connect into the internet, or so the malicious web server, download a PowerScript file and execute it in order to execute our payload to the attacking machine. So that's just that simple diagram. 
But if you're on the internal network, you would probably be easier or stealthier to just connect to your own Kali web server if you're on the internal network. So we're going to use a PowerShell command that uses an IEX cradle. This command tells client to, to download from our malicious web server the PowerShell script that we want to run and then use the uh, syntax for the interpreter Windows payload on port 443. And the IX cradle actually meant to execute it in memory. So for those wanting to replicate this, I suggest uh, base64 encoding the payload because uh, there can be issues when transferring over the wire due to white spacing or some random null bytes or something, even though they're not sent. But you can also find this technique in the, the hacker playbook number one. There is a number two now, but the URL's just down there. So for client two to download the PowerShell script from a malicious server, we need to upload it or have a web server there. So this one's just to show that we've uploaded it and it's in our plain text right there. <coughs> so to connect to client two, we'll use the invoke WMI method because that uh, remotely connects to another machine and it's uh, the Windows management instrumentation methods. We will then pass along win the Win32 process, which allows us to create a Windows process. If you use Python, it would be similar to using just the subprocess command. Uh, we'll then execute and run via the terminal. So the example here is how we simply launch Notepad. We, we use the WMI invoke with the argument Win32, and then we just create a process, argument one, Notepad XE. So it's quite simple. So using WMI, we create the, uh, the command and create the class, the process name, in order to execute the base64 encoded command with the PowerShell.enc in order to decode the base64 command. Also, this is some way to maybe bypass IDS, but I doubt it. We then um, use computer name with the IP address to connect remotely and then the credentials. And once you press enter, it tries to connect to the remote machine. It asks for client two's password. And being the same password as with the issue I mentioned before, we can just easily execute it and gain a shell. So we set up a listener to catch the reverse shell with Metasploit. As it connects to the attacking machine, we receive the shell and it automatically migrates from the Internet Explorer process because the IEX cradle will execute the command and then close it and then we lose our shell. So you really need to quickly move to another process and then we just use the get UID and we're the admin on client two using the same password. So from the blue side, we're looking at our Wireshark traffic and here we can see the TCP handshake where the client one machine, dot 101, tries to connect to client two, which is dot 104. Uh, below that, we can also see bind requests between the two. Um, here we see name queries for client two as client one is trying to connect to the right machine. Client two acknowledges that and creates a remote instance establishing a connection. So this is suspicious traffic because a local admin really shouldn't be trying to connect to another machine and then trying to uh, create an instance. So here we see the two machines talking to each other um, with a PowerShell command which tells client two to download a script from the Kali machine, and then sends an ARP request asking where the Kali machine is. So on client two, you can see it reach out to the web server and download the shell code. Uh, below that in plain text, you can see what the PowerShell script actually looks like. Uh, once that's executed, we can see Metrpreter executing through HTTPS with TLS connections, um, which is Metrpreter using its DLL injection to create a shell. Sorry. Uh, the, when we set up the GPO policy and we looked at security logs, I was actually intrigued because in this screenshot, we can see the initial connection from client one to client two with this logon ID. And the reason this is important is because on the next slide, you can see the same logon ID executing PowerShell. That would be very suspicious if local admin was connecting to local2, executing PowerShell on it, you would want to know why. And then we can even see what's even more suspicious is that after that, the PowerShell connects to our attacking machine on port 80. 
So, so that's actually pretty interesting because it's like what the, it's a good trail to follow. And power split is meant to leave no trace and run in memory, but it's obviously leaving something there. So what you can take away is that this uh, PowerShell command is connecting to a third machine internally and that this would obviously be suspicious. Um, oh, that's okay, this one. So based on the security events, you sh should correlate them, and a SIM should do that, or can do that, if you have it set up correctly. You can then test the SIM to see if those events will be picked up live. And someone's logged in from the thing. And there's LogMD, which uh, is really great for PowerShell because there's been some videos at DobyCon and whatnot where, or talks, where they remove PowerShell off the machine, still run it through the, the PowerShell.exe, and then there's meant to be no logs. But LogMD in, works better and records it somehow. I haven't looked into it too much, but it's a great recommendation for, for that side of things. The benefits of test and lateral, lateral movement is to identify and confirm that your defensive controls are in place within the network. So is malicious traffic being picked up? Things like network monitors, IDS, IPS, packet inspection, and you want to confirm that what you've paid for, your blinky box, is actually uh, providing value. Finding out that you have X in place, Xbox, and X does nothing is a great save before being pwned. So it's actually, it's great to test these things live. And for management, it's really good in gaining justification for more resources. So the whole enterprise thing, like for the last five years or so, it was let's buy all the things, but not hire anyone to run the things. And we need to break that trend. So next, I'll talk about privilege escalation. Uh, this also shows lateral mu movement. However, the focus is on grabbing the credentials off another machine. So first, why do we want to escalate privileges to domain admin? Um, domain admin privileges give ultimate control over Active, active Directory and all computers connected. Um, if you have this, uh, these privileges, you can access, tamper with, or destroy IT resources, alter or disable security policies, and auditing evidence of any action on the domain. Also, you could create new accounts with administrative privileges on resources which could be accessed at a later time, as well as place malware on any machine to achieve any variety of tasks. Um, so here, we already have our connection from the Kali machine to client one, and we have local admin privileges. Um, we've also observed that a domain admin has actually logged into client two, so now we want to grab their credentials off of there. Um, here we're using Mimikatz, which has some features for reading hashes and passwords from memory. We're running it remotely from the client one to the client two PC using PS exec. And we need to send over our DLL file to client two in order to extract these, uh, the passwords from memory on the client two. Um, so first we map the shared drive on client two to client one, send over our DLL file and then run Mimikatz get the credentials and send them back to the Kali machine. So here this is showing on client one uh, where we're mapping the client to admin share and copying over our DLL file. Uh, next we use PS exec to run Mimikatz remotely on client two and then we use the privilege debug command to check that it has the right privileges to dump passwords from memory on client two. Um, then using our logon passwords command, we can dump the plain text credentials stored in LSAS memory. As you can see, we now have domain admin logon credentials from the client to in plain text. With yeah, our secure password, it's been discovered. So from the blue team's perspective, so from the peak up, we see the two machines connecting, asking for the secure the DLL file, so it copies it over. And this would be suspicious, especially if it's named the exact DLL file. We can also see client one logging into client two as local admin is using the same password again, the same issue we've been discussing. So that's just a quick 
screenshot of that is also the next one is we see mimicats.exe being run on client two from the admin share that was um, mounted on client one with the source address of client one. So this would be very suspicious. So I don't imagine local admins having to run mimicats for any reason. We also have an event for sensitive privilege use on client two, where we can see that PS exec is uh, being executed. So it actually logs that, which is uh, really good. Even though we had to set the GPO settings and click like yes on everything, it, it can pick it up if you don't just leave it at default logging nothing. And considering this is a short time frame between client one and client two connections, you, you would notice that it's quite suspicious. So blue team takeaways from this exercise. Uh, first of all, um, prevention, uh, ways that they can improve process processes. Um, the blue team can consider access control for the shared drive, which we mapped on the other uh, PC. Um, you could also limit access to PS exec and monitor use. Um, you can consider active directory best practices for permissions to prevent uh, privilege derivation across domains. Um, also, a domain admin or any other type of user with sensitive privileges logging onto an infected PC opens up opportunities for an attacker to perform privilege escalation such as this. So from a defensive architectural perspective, it would be useful not to have a situation where a domain admin uh, would be accessing a client PC at all. Um, also, uh, maybe accounts could be created which only have minimal privileges that are required. In terms of detection, you could create IDS signatures to trigger on um, the DLL file we used, MimiCats or PSExec. Um, you could create a SIM use case looking at event correlation between system logs and network proxy logs. Uh, for example, if a domain admin logs on through RDP and then transfers the DLL file such as this. Um, for lateral movement, you could enable file level auditing on each system to monitor file modification so the logs generated from audit logs can be correlated with network events and logs. Um, the blue team may also consider implementing something such as canary accounts, which are unused accounts specifically designed for bait and will alert if they have been accessed. So this would allow the blue team to detect this type of attack right away. Um, so through this purple teaming exercise, the blue teaming becomes familiar with uh, the attacker mindset and path they may take for this type of attack. Uh, the red team sees how their attacks are observed by the blue team and any artifacts left behind. Um, they may wish to clean up the DLL file and unmap the network drive after to leave less of a footprint. Uh, when observing the blue team's detection and response uh, processes, they can also provide more thorough recommendations by identifying gaps in their processes. So after getting domain admin in your enterprise, a attacker may or should want to establish a system persistence or maintain access in case of a reboot or their shell dies. So in this example, we're going to show Twitter, which is a backdoor using Twitter. So Twitter can be downloaded on GitHub. It's another open source tool. It's actually easy to use, it's easy to install, it's just Python files, and we were actually able to send it shell code to launch Meterpreter, Meterpreter shell. So it's, and on my um, corporate workstation, antivirus didn't, didn't fire at all. So uh, from here, it's just a Python file and it uses subprocess, that's how it uh, executes the, the CMD command that you send it, so a directory listing or an IP config or whatnot. It then stores that command in a base64 encoded message on Twitter, and then the client pulls it down. So if it's written in a Python file, not many Windows machines should have Python installed by default. So you need to turn it into an executable. How do you do that? You do that with PyInstaller, free on GitHub again, easy to use. So PyInstaller will take the script you've written, or any script you steal or find on the internets, take all the modules and things you've imported, as well as the Python interpreter itself, and we'll put it into a single executable for you to use, which is pretty awesome. So for, for some scripts on Windows, we don't like to 
write in a batch, we'll write a Python file and turn it into an executable much easier. So the scenario here is that our Kali machine wants to maintain access. So it sends a command to Twitter or Twitter. The API then sends it to the implant, which is our Python executable. The Python executable receives the command, runs it, then sends the output to the API, which then sends it to a Twitter message. And from there, you have to manually retrieve the command. So in this example, we're launching the Python file. And then you write the exclamation mark CMD and the MAC address of the bot, because it automatically tries to find your, the bots, like a, zomb a zombie net or whatnot, botnet. And then it'll send the command up to the API, it runs it, puts it back, and you're given a job ID, which is like a random string. And then you just use exclamation mark retrieve as part of this syntax, and the job ID, and it pulls it down for you. So in this, this one, I think we just listed the directory. No, this is the one with the directory listing. So that's uh, exactly how you get it to run. You just retrieve it with a job ID and whatnot, and there you go. Yeah. Yep, that's yours. <laughs> so from the blue team side, it's really interesting because mostly it looks like normal traffic. All we can see are multiple requests reaching out to the Twitter API, um, which is pretty normal. Um, since the Python executable was compiled with a no console flag, when it's running, it shows nothing on the client's desktop visually. It's just running in the background. And so here um, we can see headers with the Twitter API, uh, the internal IP addresses, um, and you can see which IPs it's communicating with. Um, in the actual packet, it also says the IPs it's communicating with. And you can see the machine that's infected by the destination IP address. So what can you take away from this? So is it against policy? Should you be able to connect to Twitter? In a lot of organizations, they're blocking Twitter and GitHub. For example, I was able to use the PowerSploit one on a live client system, and I actually keylogged it. That worked. <laughs> um, <laughs> You can then see if your arc site or your net network traffic tools, monitoring tools are actually picking up known IP addresses or malicious that you've actually put in. Also, because Twitter is meant to act like a beacon, so it beacons every 60 seconds or something will be randomized, it actually doesn't have that functionality. So it's actually constant connection. So if you have anything being after hours or any constant connection to Twitter when it's blocked, it may be suspicious, you might want to look into that. Also, your browser may block it, but you may be able to connect via the API. So there are still different ways that they can get around what you think is being controlled. And then the purple, benef purple team benefits of this is, does anything alert of something beaconing out? Uh, any hunters, threat hunting that want to go look for it, look for malicious IPs, can they find it and whatnot? And then just live testing, as all the other Purple Team slides have said before, it's just testing your defending uh, staff as well as the actual appliances. So making sure it actually does what you think it's doing. So some simple data exfiltration. Our attacker now has domain admin access. They want to find some data, and they want to get it out of their network. So we just wanted to show some clear FTP data exfiltration. And then if you want to follow along at home, that's fine, because this is being aired to the internet, not. But our situation was that we have a Kali machine with Meterpreter session as domain admin. We are looking for some data, and we're just going to send it to our attacking machine in FTP with clear text. So with our uh, clear text FTP session, we are looking for some important data. We found a folder called imp underscore data. So that's pretty much all I could show from the attacking view is you've now found it. And you can write a script that searches for file names such as pass or password or usernames, as most ransomware loves to do because they like to chase the extension 
the file name or the extension, and then they'll encrypt it that way. But th in this case, we've just simply browsed to a folder with important data. So here we can see when we list it, the important data is some PII through AM underscore contacts and some very rare Pokemon JPEG and images. We should have had some um, rare Pokemon though, I think, yeah. instead. So a quick show of finding the data. So on Windows, it, uh, when you have a shell, it's mostly non-interactive if it's remotely and you're an attacker. So when you write the FTP commands, when you log in, great, and then you can't do anything else. The, the, it just shuts down. So Windows has this great ftp.s flag or syntax, and it pretty much runs a text file as a pseudo FTP script. So you simply place your username, password, and the files you either want to download or put onto the machine, and then you run that with that dash s, and it just runs it as if it's like interactively, and it downloads nice and easy. So here it downloads our Pokemon, and then we simply close the connection. And then here's just a screenshot to show we have our Pokemon in our FTP home directory. So from the blue team side, we can see the DLL injection on Wireshark and also lots of chatter created on the network. Um, we see everything is in clear text. So we can see the FTP response and requests is not stealthy at all. Uh, the username and passwords are also in clear text right there. And then here we can see successful file transfer and our Pokemon are all being stolen off the network. <laughs> and so the simple takeaway from this talk is if you want to go home and practice is that you want to test if a simple FTP transfer would be would trigger on your network. So hopefully by default your security appliance or whatever the vendor has sold you would see this. So you could then test to see when it's picked up, if, if that's after the data's been sent out or when the data's been sent out. So you can have a look at that. And then if it is picked up, what is your IR process? So the investigators that say, hey, we've seen this, did, did they respond urgently enough? Did they just see the alert and go, oh, it's another alert, overflow, who cares, sort of thing? And then you may want to create or block FTP. I don't really see business use for FTP, but if you do have one, you may want to just create a group for FTP. And whitelisting remote FTP servers would be great. Internally, would be easy to, to whitelist. So purple team exercise, again, as we've said, uh, on all the slides, it's all about training, testing what you have, and if it triggers, when does it trigger? You may want to swap it, tune it to your environment. So if you're used to seeing 30, 30 megabytes be sent out, set your uh, alerting higher, your threshold higher, maybe 500 megabytes or a gig or something, whatnot, and just, yeah, play around and have some live exercises. So in conclusion, we think purple teaming is really good, you should invest in it, and it's probably the way of the future from pen testing to red teaming to adversary threat simulation. Uh, yep, so if you are gonna implement purple teaming, there are different stages. You may wanna do it quarterly with just the wall rooming and drawing it up theory-based. You may wanna do six-month live exercises and then Yearly, you may want to involve the executives. So from, from like a business continuity management perspective, you may want to do the whole war room thing where we've, we've been infiltrated, it detected here, the execs decide, oh, crap, our data's being lost, what do we do? And sort of the whole organisation gets involved. So in our talk, we showed an example of a purple team exercise showing both the red and blue team perspectives of an attack on a network. Um, we've limited our scope of detection tools to Windows Server, Event Logs, and Wireshark. However, um, we're interested in extending to enterprise security tools such as SIM or IDS. Uh, future work could also include exploring PowerShell and WMI for blue teaming uh, defense purposes, as it's an incredibly powerful tool which could also be used for monitoring and detection. Also, from the red team, um, 
we could have more advanced attacks and persistence using PowerShell Empire. Uh, <laughs> and I promised via Twitter an obligatory, however you pronounce the word, a cute cat picture. So here we go. So we hope. So, so, <laughs> oh, <laughs> everyone all are at it. Yeah, we hope everyone learnt something from the attacker side, the blue team side, and mixing the two. So thank you very much. from questions, you've already got your, your prize. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate all the work that you did. And it's, it's wonderful that people know where you're at. I really like it. Uh, so here's a question. I wonder if you have limited ad roles when you talk about the blue team side. So for example, from the standpoint of the uh, software stack, the network stack, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can't block it. No? <laughs> no? Why not? Because it's heavily used in the organization. We yeah. don't have control of that. Internally? Oh, yeah, you, uh, have, you have the huge, <laughs> yeah. The question was, is there any one application or security appliance that correlates all logs, all network traffic, everything? And apparently not. Sets a workstation, and then you hijack the local, like that that tech admin, which then uh, uh, would hijack the domain admin. And apparently, ROBC is a really good one. <laughs> apparently, because domain admin is the individual has credentials in there. Um, don't believe the uh, admin credentials in memory stay upon reboot. Right, but so this would probably be cached. Like yeah. Days and you're somehow mini pad is tapping into the LSS process. Yep. So the read-only directory domain controllers, yeah, definitely susceptible to that. I've heard those are a bit different. Yeah. Yep, up the back. Yeah. So uh, how do you move on through the system? And so there's, there's obviously a value for the blue team to create the first team early on. Um, would you say that it's more valuable for uh, the blue team to be unaware of the red team attacking them? Or is there more value to I think there's more value in them knowing that they're attacking because um, in this exercise, we would actually have the blue team sitting with the red team while they were doing their attack so they could understand it better. So, yeah, that's a bit more. But with that, it depends on your objective. So if you want to see, say, your current state that you think you have, you can then run the red team and the blue team not know, whereas the purple team idea is that based from that, from the blue team not knowing, based on the gaps and what you've identified, what got through, what didn't, how what the IR response was, there would be great value in then training 
based on that and then trying it again with them knowing together, I think would be the best way to mix and match. I don't know, I'm not Twitter, but uh, it, it's not very stealthy at all. It's just a connects to an API and then it connects into your account's Twitter messages and leaves it base64 encoded. So I don't think privacy-wise they can read your messages, although they probably read everything. So I'm not sure why Twitter hasn't blocked it. Maybe there was a change in the API, but you just need the authentication tokens and the the correct credentials for the API to work and then it can send the traffic. Sorry, what? Yeah. <laughs> An external red team? Yeah. Yeah, it would be great. <laughs> <laughs> now, it'd be like Veris Group Advanced. Uh, yeah, I've only ever been able to do the blue team side with the red team side team side of it. So yeah, I exactly. It's Microsoft or whatnot has that test is your. I think that's how you pronounce it. But yeah, there's not many places that have an internal red team. <laughs> yeah, that was my.